Because we give the sky its color, literally we award the sky its color, I can make changes to your context of vision that then color the sky. Basically, the light I'm using is not the light you're looking at. You're looking at the result of this into the sky. In terms of this encounter with color, which is basically what this really is, you, you come to see colors that you haven't seen before because the colors really are not there. think we receive everything, that everything comes to us, but in fact, we're very much a part of the perception that we create. Buenas noches, en nombre de Isabel y Agustín Coppel del Jardín Botánico y de SIAC, agradecemos su presencia esta noche en que con motivo de la apertura de Encounter, la pieza que James Turrell ha creado para el Jardín Botánico, tenemos la presencia de James Turrell y Michael Govan, que nos darán una charla sobre el trabajo de James. Pero antes de empezar, le quiero ceder la palabra a Agustín Coppel Luken, que les quiere dirigir unas palabras, al término de los cuales podrán seguir con la conversación. Eh, la conversa, al término de la conversación eh, se abrirá una sesión de preguntas, entonces estaremos aquí deseosos de seguir con ustedes. Gracias. Buenas noches a todos. Eh, para Isabel, mi esposa y para todo el equipo que ha participado en el desarrollo, concepto, y sueño que ha sido este proyecto increíble del Jardín Botánico. Es un placer que nos acompañen esta noche, en que tenemos el honor de recibir al gran artista James Turrell y el director del Museo del Condado de Los Ángeles, Michael Govan, con motivo de la apertura de Encounter. Agradecemos a todos los importantes personajes que nos acompañan en estas cálidas latitudes. Puedo ver entre nosotros a muchos amigos, a mi tío Gastón Luquen, a Hugh Davis, así como amigos que vienen desde California, la Ciudad de México, de Monterrey, hasta de Miami hay uno por aquí. James Turrell ha creado Sky Spaces en todos los continentes, desde Estados Unidos hasta Argentina y desde Japón hasta Australia. Hoy nos complace compartir con ustedes la pieza que ha creado, que ha diseñado especialmente para el, para el proyecto del Jardín Botánico aquí en Culiacán, siendo la primera obra de Turrell abierta constantemente a todo el público de nuestro país. Todavía recuerdo la primera vez que James visitó el Jardín Botánico, hace más de nueve, diez años, cuando solo estaban las plantas washingtonias en este preciso espacio y el auditorio en el que estamos no era ni un proyecto. En esa primera visita, James escogió el lugar en donde ahora se ubica Encounter y desde entonces empezamos a trabajar en conjunto el estudio de James Turrell, el Jardín Botánico y SIAC. Quiero aprovechar el espacio para reconocer el gran trabajo que ha venido haciendo la arquitecta sinaloense Bárbara Podaca y todo su gran equipo de trabajo. Muchas felicidades, de verdad. Así como la labor y dedicación de todos los que tenemos años reuniéndonos a pensar y apoyar este gran proyecto, como son Carlos Murillo, Carlos Gandarilla, Oscar Vélez, Ernesto Beltrán, Erika Pagaza, Alberto Fernández y el, todo el equipo de la constructora Paralelo, y al equipo de SIAC, a Mireya, a Magnolia, a Marta y a todos, muchas gracias por todo lo que han hecho. El rigor y la calidad del trabajo de Turrell se ha visto reflejado en esta obra. El empleo de la geometría en la construcción, la luz y el color, así como la elipse perfecta, nos cambia la manera en que percibimos el cielo en el amanecer y atardecer, y a la vez la manera de ver. El compromiso 
de James Turrell con su trabajo queda reflejado con sus visitas a Culiacán a lo largo de estos años. Solo en los últimos seis meses nos visitó en dos ocasiones para seguir de cerca todos los detalles de la pieza. Encounter es parte del amplio y ambicioso proyecto, el del Jardín Botánico, en el que convivimos los visitantes con la naturaleza, la botánica, el arte y la arquitectura, y en donde cada uno de estos aspectos está muy bien pensado para ampliar la experiencia del visitante y para hacer brillar y destacar a cada uno por el contraste y a veces por la interacción entre estos elementos. Quiero también destacar la gran idea y visión de nuestro curador de arte y queridísimo amigo Patrick Charpenel, así como la labor de la arquitecta Tatiana Bilbao, autora de la obra de este auditorio en el que nos encontramos. Para todos los que de alguna forma somos parte del Jardín Botánico, el camino que hemos emprendido con este proyecto y en el que estamos andando, lo valoramos más aún que llegar a un final. El Jardín Botánico, así como la vida de todos, es un lugar en, en proceso. En este caso, el del desarrollo de la naturaleza en el jardín mismo, el del intercambio, la interacción del público con la botánica y con las obras de arte, el mantenimiento de todo el espacio, la atracción de más visitantes, la creación a prueba y error de los programas educativos y el gran proceso de generar conciencia en la comunidad, de orgullo por nuestra tierra, donde no todo es lo que nos encontramos, sino lo que podemos hacer e inspirar a los demás. Pero estos procesos o caminos implican a la vez un gran compromiso y responsabilidad de nuestra parte, con la naturaleza misma, con los artistas y con el público. Les agradezco que esta noche estén aquí y les dejo estas ideas y pensamientos para que podamos escuchar la interesante conversación entre James Turrell y Michael Govan. Thank you, thank you, Augustine. This I just want to say, this is my second visit, uh, and this place is really incredible. You are to be congratulated for all you and everyone has done. Um, to have art within nature that is a museum of nature uh, and what it does for the community is fantastic. So Thank you're you. to be congratulated. Um, so I, to, uh, we just put together, I put together a few images of other works by James Turrell. Some of you may know a lot of them, but perhaps not. And I thought we would talk a little about where this work comes from. Um, this work is so different in so many ways than other works I have seen. I've seen so many works, but this, is, uh, this work here in the garden is at a completely different level in terms of painterly color. Um, I think the extravagance of the architecture which seems to bear some relationship to even the, not just the stupa pieces, but spaceships and follies and, and all kinds of architectural images. Um, and for those of you who have not been to many sky spaces, um, this one was perhaps the most dramatic performance I have ever seen. Uh, usually there, and in the earliest, there's a a very slow and meditative movement towards this black blue, the deep black blue. But here you gave us a spectacular performance of color and then right at the end, we saw blues right to black. It was, a, it was theatrical. <laughs> <laughs> Another flower in the garden. Another flower in the garden. So. <laughs> um, Maybe theatrical as a word, when you started your work in the 60s uh, and what was going on in New York at that time was there was a word, I, I don't like the word, but minimalism, things being made simpler in art. Um, 
And there was a lot of criticism of your work because uh, your work didn't have a tangible object. It was, uh, I think it was described sometimes as theatrical. Yes, well that, you know, New York is sort of always thought to be a city of culture and Los Angeles was uh, thought to be a city of entertainment. <laughs> so uh, definitely we were involved in more of the theater of the complete piece, that is we would detail the whole space out more uh, right. uh, so that the context was clearly set. And so people called that, I remember uh, Clement Greenberg saying that this, well he said it to me as a way of not a compliment to say that the work was theatrical and I was, I said, and the criticism is? Right, you know, <laughs> what's wrong with that? That's right. <laughs> um, anyway, that was, and the other thing, this was a time when a lot of the artists in New York were dealing with uh, black, gray, lead, and colors of that sort. And so to take on a richness of color was thought to be, um, I don't know, almost frivolous. Well, and this piece is so colorful, I guess it does. I was thinking it did maybe have something to do with being in this garden and being in Mexico, where there is so much color. Well, I think that um, emotion is more fully dealt with in Latin culture than it is in Germany, England, America. Right. Um, that's very, very different kind of um, dealing with emotion. And that, that was one of the strangest yeah. things is I, for a long time, uh, people would write reviews and it have mostly to do with the technique rather than, right. Right. Rather than what it was coming out. And, and I felt that that had to do with more the kind of emotion you get with, from music than, than normally from art. And that this emotion actually came more from how light was dealt with. You know, Skuryabin, the, com the composer, Russian composer, wrote all his music to go together with uh, a presentation of light. And his wife played the color organ, which I went to see in Moscow at his, at his home. It was quite, quite crude, but it was very effective, and there it was. And uh, he used the scales of relationships between um, musical notes and colors that Spensky and uh, Gurdjieff used, and that came from this man called Remington, who was very much who studied sensory synesthesia, and that's what I also studied at, at school. So sensory synesthesia, maybe it's worth saying something about that because um, this idea that you can you cross senses that a color might connect to a smell or some other sense, right, is the simple definition. I, we have a work at LACMA right now, which is a room which fills with color like this, and I have been with people who feel tempe radical temperature changes. Um, I haven't had so much smell, but, but even, even hunger and a sense of uh, other senses that they feel, and of course, also changes in emotion. I don't know how many people here felt a kind of uh, almost musical change in emotion in this piece. Mm -hmm. um, but that comes from, I mean, early 20th century modernists were interested. Kandinsky talked a lot about how music yeah. and color come together. Uh, and we, Thomas Wilfred is an American artist who was from New York at the turn of the century, born a little yes. before the century and made had color organs and made works that changed color. But in some ways, um, you've waited till the very, not the, the, to the, it's been the last third of your career, of your work, that you've been able to do these more time-based, yeah. mu almost musical performances in light. Well, several things there is that um, we finally have a, a technology where we can actually change color. Right. Um, if you're an, a painter, you can go to the local art store and get hundreds of colors mixed already for you. Um, there was a time when you almost had to be an alchemist uh, in, and make your own paint. Um, and so that's how I started. I had to actually make my own color and mix it 
And I did that usually with uh, neon light and big selsons and things like this to be able to change the color. The problem with a uh, neon light is it never goes off. You have to have about 8% light on because it will then just pop off. And when you start it on, it sort of bursts on. It, you can't get a very tiny amount. Mm -hmm. In the morning program, you'll find it much more sensitively dealt with. And so it's quite different. It's good to actually understand if you go see the morning program and then see the night program, you can see the difference in what the piece is, uh, morning to night. That's somewhat valuable. But I was always interested in the big thing was this change from night to day and the change from day to night. Because we were not made for the light of the noonday sun. We, our pupils are absolutely closed. We squint and even wear dark glasses. And it's not until the light is reduced and the pupil opens that feeling comes out of the eyes like touch. And then you really can feel and experience light as this sort of magic elixir that it is. I mean, we have this relationship to light. We drink it through the skin as vitamin D. In other words, ultraviolet through skin makes vitamin D. So light is a food, part of our diet. Without it, um, there are some big health issues, particularly uh, with the relationship to serotonin and depression. And then, of course, we have this very emotional response to, to color and to light. Plus, there's a spiritual quality, too, and a lot of people will feel that just in a piece like this. But if you think about um, Saul on the road to Damascus, where he had this epiphany, think about um, uh, Ezekiel, in the first chapter of Ezekiel, I think about uh, Samadhi, uh, the Buddha, and enlightenment and the light-filled void. And even with uh, near-death experience, all of these things with light are described using a vocabulary of light. Mm -hmm. So light is, that we have this big relationship to light, but it's not rec until recently that we actually looked at light. Generally, we use light to illuminate other things. I just happen to like the thingness or the substance of light itself. Which is perfect to talk about this first work in light, Aphram, from 1966. And this was one of the first works in the big retrospective exhibition we made in Los Angeles. And one of the first works you made in this way, with light, yes. um, that Hang, that is in a gallery, it hangs there. Touch seems to be very much what this is oh, also wow, yes. about. But you can't tell in this slide, but when that light hangs there, it is as, as if it can be touched, um, that it has a three-dimensional quality, which I guess was the primary point for you at this that's, moment. That's where we started, yeah, I started. That idea of the touch. Yeah. And then sometimes in the aperture pieces that have this opening, it fills up the space uh, right to this opening and you feel as though it's a surface to touch. So then, says then, and that was done in a corner as you saw, and there's a fantastic quality of how the light gathers in the corner and creates this physical object, but th again, then you, these are pieces that were made kind of across a corner, mm. and this is where you first had that uh, experiment where you could feel the light as a skin, right, as a surface? Surface, yeah. And um, the key to that was this sharp edge, correct? Like the part of it is the... As it is here with the piece here. In other words, right. I'd like to bring the feeling of the space of sky coming right down to the top of the space that you're in, almost as though it glasses over as a substance. This, when you come upon these works, people think that they are a piece of glass or something that's put there like a sky space. So question, I looked at this and I thought, oh, you must have seen this at one point and it almost looks in perspective like with those first sky spaces and you, you know, it was just about putting it up above and using the natural mm -hmm. light. Was that the sequence or did it these? It was, basically I started out thinking of, uh, you know, Book Seven of the Republic, uh, Plato's Cave, where 
where he talks about light coming into the cave, imaging this, quote, real world upside down backwards on the cave wall. And what I literally did was take the space on the inside of a building and make it all perfectly white. And then I would put light onto it. The strange thing is that when you put a shape of light onto the wall, it would not reside on the same plane as the wall. I thought, wow, that's, that's fantastic. This is a very plastic or malleable medium uh, and very painterly. So I have sort of, these things kind of worked with a picture plane. Mm -hmm. So my work really came more out of uh, a painter's space in three dimensions than it did uh, that of a sculptor or architect. But that all came later because I soon found I had, you know, our light was just not very significant in relationship to the light of the sun. So I had to make these spaces that protected and apprehended light for our perception. Um, you know, sometimes people have asked me when they buy a work, what do they own? And I say, well, you, you own the light that's passing through. <laughs> and, oh, excuse me here. And, it, and that was um, maybe not the thing to say to a collector, but it, it was, in fact, the case. <laughs> um, but, you know, we do this with sound. We're able to sell sound or whatever, you know, music and all that. So I thought, um, I thought the object was a, a little bit of an impediment. Right. And, but I, but there's still, with the, all these, there is thingness. That you feel this thing yeah. that, and that presence of light. And so the big thing there was um, not having light illuminate other things, but getting the thingness of light, of light to be right. felt. And before you did the um, Afram, of course, you were working in your studio in Santa Monica and making apertures, openings yes. in the windows or cracks where light would come in and you experimented. That you, was more like Plato's cave, where I actually right, exactly. took light from outside and imaged it on the wall surfaces. So that you had that Plato's yeah, and cave. And across the floor and ceiling. Yeah. Which you see clearly going to Afram. Then this seems to be a, a big step. And is it that you think, well, then you're going to go back to that being a big aperture and you will use nature and natural light? And does, is that a, how yeah, did I, you get from here to the PS1? This is the first, yes, I, the first I just sky spaces. Took that, the wall or the picture plane and then cut a hole in it, through it. Mm -hmm. But then also a, a kind of opening so that you didn't see the thickness of the opening. So it was very perfectly trying to make something that could be on the same plane. The, for, this works the same way as the piece outside where this knife edge or very sharp edge, it functions to glue. I feel like it glues the sky right to the, to the, uh, to the top. You can't see it as well yes, in this yes. one. Uh, well, um, here is the, and this is the piece at Panza's. I just, for, yes for fun, <coughs> put after this one, oops, Joseph Albers. Do all of you know Albers paintings? <coughs> um, and you must have studied these well, I think phenomena I, very. Like Bergen, he, he liked Albers quite a bit too. This idea that um, the context, I mean, color is very malleable and, and it's the context of vision uh, that allows you to change the color of the sky. I mean, obviously I'm not changing the color of the sky, but I'm changing your perception of it by changing your context of vision. We're not that well aware of the fact that we award the sky its color and how, how much we're a part of that which we perceive. So my interest always is to give a sort of a gentle little nudge, a reminder of the fact that we are very much a part of that which we behold. All that in front of us, we do create. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important that we realize how much of this reality that we live within, we are responsible for making. Well, and that's what comes out when you read Albert and you, you think about that, you realize how seeing is a half and half proposition. And it's what's there and what's what I put into it. And that does revolutionize the way you think about art. Well, when you see it, Ed Reinhardt and you see him bringing color out of blackness, out of darkness, it's just, that, that's amazing and that's, um, 
truly a very strict approach to the sublime that he, he, he used. Rothko was uh, a little more slapdash. I mean, he sometimes really hit it and sometimes didn't. Right. But um, the two of them really did do it with bringing light out of paint. I mean, making paint almost truly like light. So I guess, yeah, Rothko would be the sunset program and Reinhardt would be the sunrise program, yes, right? Yes, that's true. <laughs> it works that way. And then we throw in a little bit of Turner and, and don't forget Constable and his paintings of clouds. Um, exactly, the paintings of clouds. Everyone saw that in the sky there. And he would start, he started with a horizon and then he eliminated the horizon. And I'm, I'm interested in this, the new landscape without horizon. And that, which, which is what you create in these works, right? Th yeah. This is LAC, this is at, Los a at LACMA in Los Angeles and this was the last one of the last works in the exhibition but is still there. And it is a space where you can feel that picture plane, same way as the blue piece, the, the uh, diamond piece, and it feels like it's a solid. But in this case, you can walk up steps and then walk through it well, into had, another space. I had some earlier spaces without the stairs and uh, twice people um, dove into the piece <laughs> thinking it was soft. <laughs> so I thought, well, now I'll just put some stairs up there and assist you in. <laughs> very, uh, yeah, very uh, Mayan pyramid like those stairs too, right? Well, I like that, that I do like the pyramidal form. Um, the, what happens when, when, happens when you go inside this piece, I don't know why we're, oh, there we go. Okay, so we get in, I don't know if there's one before. When you get inside the piece, you are in this space filled with color. You are mm -hmm. in color, and again, this piece changes. And I think very much about, we looked at Albers, mm -hmm. and Albers was able to put two colors next to each other and create a difference in how you see color. And you could, he could demonstrate that by putting two different frames around the same color and the middle color would be different. But what you've achieved in these works is also to have color in time, like the work here at the garden. So that what happens um, is that you're making color in time somehow because when I, I don't know if you were in the, anybody was in the beginning of the piece when it's very purple and then if you step outside the world looks entirely green right like all it is green because of the plants but it looks even more green when you've been in purple and this is this idea of relativity of color but it's also true that we have relativity of color in time it doesn't it, last we only hold a color about eight seconds right and so you step into this and then it seems as though someone's changing the color when that's only that fading is coming from the saturation of, of the cones in your retina. And so it's just seeming to disappear. But you are mixing color in time. Yes. Because as this piece changes, you receive your eyes mix this color. That's not quite the color there. It's yes. a combination of the color that you retain and the color that you receive. Um, which is a fantastic thing to think about mixing color in time and not just on a surface. Uh, it takes painting a, another step for sure. Uh, but it is worth saying also these works, as you were saying, are without horizon, that mm -hmm. all of our history of painting and our experience of our lives, because we are land-based land -based beings, we always have a horizon. And yet these works have no horizon. But they this, are this new world that we're stepping into in space, uh, there's no horizon. In flying, when you have um, the flight into instrument conditions when it's cloudy, skiing with whiteout, even whiteout on roads when you have snowstorms and you get this white whiteout condition, also underwater where you get the sort of rapture of the deep often people don't know which way is up because uh, if you have a neutral density belt um, the only way you can know which way is up is to see which way your bubbles go so that there are, are these places we've stepped into this new landscape 
a new horizonless landscape, and that's certainly true in cyberspace. No up, no down, no left or right. In fact, that's how you can look at all the images of my work. It doesn't much matter if you have it right side up or upside down. Sometimes uh, we put a person there just so you would know, otherwise I, you wouldn't. I, I don't, I don't I care, for, you don't like care for the person pictured in, <laughs> in, my, in, in these slides, but people seem to always do that. Because <laughs> there wouldn't be much that you'd see. Although I have to say, down in Australia, they had three days of um, nude, uh, visits to the to the show, um, and the thing was amazing. Is it would be so uh, sort of bleached out. All you could see was people's hair and their eyebrows, and that was uh, quite quite amazing. Which is, uh, I mean, you think that you would be exposed in this light, but in fact, it's all that's, that's all light. erased. <laughs> Clothed in light. That's right. The, the true raiment of light. That's right. Clothed in light. Um, I just want to just for a second flip back and then we'll go to Roden Crater that this yes. is this is again the 60s. Um, this is in Los Angeles again at LACMA on the left with Robert Irwin, another important artist who was working in LA at the time and the two of you collaborating with yes. Uh, Ed Wirtz, who was a, a right there, a, a scientist who worked for the Garrett Corporation in, and for NASA, the Aerospace Administration, thinking about the habitability of space, right? Yes, we were working on the space lab. The space lab. And yeah. that led to works um, and a lot of experimentation, but things that you couldn't realize until now. And, and I just want to say that it's very exciting to me to see an artist like you who is worked for a few years, but your works now seem to be... 50 years. 50 years. years, okay, 50 years. I wasn't gonna say how many years. <laughs> but not only are you pursuing ideas that you had in 1967 in ways that in 68, 69, that there, you couldn't achieve the results then because of technology and other uh, things, but that the last, these last years, you've had more new breakthroughs, I think, perhaps because of the technology, but also yeah. because of all that time of seeing color. Well, I remember uh, Sam Francis, who was an artist who very wonderfully helped support younger artists. I was one of them. And uh, I asked him one time why he would keep returning to themes that he had been involved with for most of his life. And he said, well, you know, uh, he thought that artists would like to beat around the bush and they just beat around the bush till they damn well beat it out of the bush. <laughs> <laughs> that was his expression about That's keeping at it. Keeping at it, right. Yeah. Which you've done, and in many, many ways. There are themes in your work that are consistent. This is um, a perceptual cell that you lie down, go inside, and there is definitely no up, no down, uh, no sense of distance or space. You think it would be small, but actually the space inside here becomes infinite at moments, and you also are able to see literally from behind your eye is uh, uh, this, that, that behind, behind the, the eye, eye seeing. seeing yeah. um, all of these different ways of dealing with, and color becomes key to this too, uh, as you experience this. This will be in Los Angeles again in, in a few, several months, a few months, so you'll be able to come back and see this piece. But I just wanted to talk for a few minutes about your big project um, that has taken nearly 50 years. Well, Michael does uh, sell himself as a director of a museum, but, but I know him as a pilot who was I witnessed it would fly underneath the wires instead of going over them. Um, so <laughs> this is how I knew Michael very early on, so as a pilot. <laughs> we would fly together, that's true, and you took me flying over the same landscape uh, in Arizona where you found, after a systematic survey of, from your airplane of the United States, you found Roden Crater, and if this picture were in color, you would see you had red hair, right, when Roden yes. Crater started. So I just want to, this is just a measure of how long the project has taken. <laughs> yes, it, it actually, we're realizing it took 12 years to do this project, and, and t uh, 12 years when I first met Mireya on, about it and came down here, and uh, you know, uh, Roden Crater is taking some time too, um, I have to say that uh, 
I'm probably like, you, you may know some friends that still have to finish their doctoral thesis and still are still working on it. Well, I'm one of those. <laughs> <laughs> Here you are with your airplane that you were flying, the same type of airplane at if, that time. If you go back, you can see the distinct shape of the helio. Well, yes, there. It is made for short takeoff and landing, uh, often and, very short. And there it is and in there the background. There, yeah. In the company color. Yes. Which is blue, if you hadn't noticed. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I just wanted to show that this, uh, just to connect flying to Roden Crater, uh, there are so many beautiful descriptions of, of a, a kind of consciousness which is changed through flying, through being in the air, through di being in a different perspective, seeing in 360 degrees, which is rare to see the horizon in 360 degrees. And perhaps someone who wrote most beautifully about that was Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, the great French uh, pilot and author who wrote about flying. And you probably know him as the author of The Little Prince. And uh, uh, this is the James Terrell as Little Prince part of the talk where I love this illustration from The Little Prince because the little prince has to uh, clean out his volcano <laughs> on his small planet. Uh, and it seems like you've been doing this for some time, taking care, of the, taking care of your volcano in Arizona. But my favorite part of the little prince is when he talks about his planet being so small. And the planet shrinking is an obvious metaphor for aviation and flight, which yes. shrinks the world. Space, right? The world shrinks. And he says, my planet is so small, I can watch the sunset, and then I can move my chair and watch it again. And in some ways, I think a lot of your work is, a, is, is about that somehow, of watching yeah. this, being able to watch the sunset as many times well, I thought about, um, as you want. Having pieces so that uh, sky spaces, so it was always coming into the sweet spot of the twilight. And so, if there are 24 time zones, you'd have 24, so it, that means it would always be coming, because it takes about an hour of, that you have for twilight, as you saw tonight. So 24 would actually, if they're on the equator, would be all you'd need, but actually you only need 12, because when it's coming into one at night, it's also coming into one in the morning. But then, of course, if you change your latitude and go up higher, the twilight lasts longer in the summer, and so you don't really need that many. But I, I wanted to make these, uh, well, I, I thought a certain number would be good, and I was very taken by Prince Ashoka, who uh, thought he would make 1,000 stupas for the Buddha. So that, well, but he was a prince, so maybe I don't need to make quite as many. So. <laughs> You could make a thousand sky yes. spaces, you have a little time. Well, yes, I mean, I, I have made uh, 75 the Republic. So uh, that seems like quite a few. They're all unique, as you saw tonight. They're each, each different in the light different. program, different <laughs> in the form and all of that. But um, there was this artist, uh, Quaker artist, my family's Quaker, so I was interested in the Peaceable Kingdom. This is a painting that was made by Edward Hicks. And he uh, always would have the lion and the lamb. This shows you how naive the Quakers are about war and the use of force. Is that the lion would always lie down with the lamb. And these paintings uh, depicted in one, the Indian signing the only treaty that was kept by America with William Penn, he was signing the treaty with uh, the Indians. And then uh, it turns out he's made a hundred, over a hundred of these paintings, um, all with different themes, but they always had the lion and the lamb, and they were always titled The Peaceable Kingdom. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll make a hundred, and that, that ought to do. And, uh, <laughs> but these sort of illusions that you have in fantasies are, are no different than anyone else. I mean, um, making a pyramid uh, in the Yucatan or making one in, out of a volcano in Arizona, um, it would be a lot easier if I were a pharaoh, but uh, I, 
don't remember having been one, even though Shirley MacLaine does. <laughs> exactly. But, but here, it's not that hard to make a, a, a pyramid out of this, because the pyramid is already made. I just have to put the tunnels in. Right. Yes. Here it is, the Pyramid of Rodent Crater. So I just wanted to say, this, this project, you, this modern art that you make, but yet it does have so many relationships to other landforms, architecture made of earth, in this case, yes. Maze How. Mount, or and mound builders. Yeah. Mound builders. This is Rodent Crater. Again, the mound in this desert landscape. It is like a pyramid where um, it exists in this flat desert and its pyramidal form up, held up above the sky. But also, uh, there are so many, not just um, pyramids in Mexico, but this is uh, Bora Badur, yes. the many stupas all in one. Um, does Roden Crater, I feel like you found a lot of these references later and attach them to Roden Crater. It's not as if Roden Crater is a copy of these ancient monuments, but I always feel like you keep finding things in the past that connect to these intuitions you had about light and the desert. Well, this, in is, that space. this is the same kind of revisionist history that everyone makes up in their own personal life. And so I just did it in art, and so I was very interested in also the revisionist history of looking at um, how this kind of installation work was done earlier in the 19th century, um, the great exhibitions and shows that they would have of dioramas, panoramas, and camera obscuras. Um, and in fact, one of the famous artists everyone knows, of course, is um, that, that did a diorama was was Daguerre. Now Daguerre was a painter. He just wanted to be able to fix this image he saw in the camera obscura. And so uh, he did and made the invent of the Daguerreotype. But prior to that, he made these amazing dioramas. And you'd come up, there was a platform, and you'd come up stairs from underneath, then a large, usually circular shape. And he, he had this one in the Paris exhibition where when the lights were on on the inside, you saw this daytime scene of a, in the Swiss Alps with the mountains and all that. And then, then the light would go down on the inside and come up on the outside. And you'd see the clouds um, were darkened by being thicker paint. And then uh, there would be little lights down in the, in the chalets. And so you had this, an installation painting, even Stations of the Cross um, by um, Barnett, uh, Newman. Barnett Newman was really an installation painting because you would go from one to the next, although it would have an order, but you could reverse the order, but there were all these ones that were next to each other. So you actually had to take them in some kind of order that he, that he had made for you. So this idea of installation painting was very interesting and also related a lot to, so I, and that was, a very populist form that happened at these great exhibitions. And so I've kind of looked at that kind of, almost as a populist art, I guess. An art that you didn't have to know every movement in art that had come before in order to understand what you're looking at. So that you could just come to it and have direct experience, and that, that was enough. So that, that's another part of the, my revisionist history that I talk about, too. It seems to me Roden Crater encompasses all these histories and again time. I mean, here you have this is looking from this is a drawing, a etching, I guess a etching made photo etching, yeah. where you're looking above and here you see the tunnels and chambers that are cut into the pyramid and light can pass through these tunnels. Um, this is very tall. This is as tall as a skyscraper, and this is almost a, it's about three quarters of a mile, almost a kilometer, right? from, well, uh, not no, quite, that's, that half. No, that's two, two, two miles. Two miles from yeah. this edge all the way to here. Yeah. Um, just to give you a sense of scale. But one of the things I love about Roden Crater is it seems to be an eye when you look down on it, looking out at the stars and the universe. It's somehow. very much that, because if you look at, say, the Roman sculptures and some Greek sculpture, the eye was 
uh, cut back in. There, you, you saw the eye and then the pupil was cut back in. Sometimes they would put something in it, like a spot or something on it, but it actually had this um, carving out. So this eye, this thing that sits on the earth is an eye, it's a camera, yeah. it witnesses the universe, it brings light inside it, not unlike our real eye. This is just an example, this is one of the spaces um, in the in section, this is an architectural drawing, so you've sliced across it, so you'd walk up these stairs and look inside this sphere. But um, there is a, another space above with a sky space, an opening, and this is a bath. So you can lie down in the bath. So I use the water as one of the uh, elements of the lens. Right, and that water of the bath serves as a lens to project the stars down on sand. White, white sand. Here, which is again an eye. Yeah. And so there's this human metaphor there's a, a cosmic metaphor. This is uh, Boulez, the great French uh, architect's never built cenotaph for Newton, Isaac Newton, which was day for night. This was, you would walk in and there would be holes poked in it so that you could see the night sky during the day and then at night it would be illuminated as a sun to show this sort of power over the universe that an artist, an architect, a thinker, a scientist could have. And I just you, you, since you can't be at Roden Crater right now, it's just worth saying this, the thing you started with, the malleability, that you can take light and you can move it like clay. That Roden Crater, which is that bowl, uh, has this quality where it can change the shape of the sky, not just the color. But when you're in it, the sky, when you're in this bowl of Roden Crater, the sky changes its shape. And it's hard to explain that. It's one, hard but. to explain that. And this is just a page from a book that describes some of those things. But I guess I want to ask this, it, this idea of like the um, nature. There's a history of humans wanting to dominate nature the, the, or understand it, dominate it. And we've tried also through philosophy and art to come to peace with it. Um, and I'm interested whether you think about a philosophy of nature. Here you are in a garden you've changed the shape of the sky, you've changed its color, you've sort of played with it. Do you have a philosophy of this sort of man and nature, human and nature? One of the things I've always, people hear, hear me say is that uh, uh, they talk about natural light and artificial light. I just have to say there is no such thing as artificial light. You have to burn something for it to release the energy that we see as light, and the light that's given off is characteristic of the material you're burning and the temperature at which it's burned. So there's truth in light in a number of ways. And, and I remember doing these, uh, you know, these little magnetron pieces that look like televisions, except I take a television aim it the wrong way, and so you get the average light. And the thing that's really interesting is that you can see that, it doesn't have any image, it's just the average light, and you can look at a program that is a mm -hmm. comic, I mean a children's cartoon, um, a sporting event, um, the newscast with the blue screen, and you can look at a porn movie, and I can have these, all these there, and within five minutes you can identify correctly what you're looking at, without seeing any image. So, of course, we can know a star without touching it by looking at its light. You can tell what the star is made of, that is the material that's being burned, and you can tell the temperature at which it's being burned, and you can tell how fast the star is receding away from us by how it shifted in Doppler effect into, toward the red end of the spectrum. So there's really this great knowing just from how things are revealed in light. And I said before, this is this wonderful elixir that connects the dream world. Remember, we have full vision with the eyes closed. Sometimes greater lucidity of color in the dream, sometimes greater clarity than we do with the eyes open. So here's this thing that connects the uh, dream world with the so-called real world. 
that we, the conscious awake state, and also this thing that we eat as a food, um, that we have an emotional response to, uh, and, and then uh, the reason that I present it in this way without using image is that when you look and stare into a fire, you often sort of drift off. Um, there's this wonderful thing that you get looking, staring at a fire. In fact, they even now at Christmas time have a program that just is a fire burning on television. And you just see people turn this on in their houses at, around Christmas. It's bizarre. But <laughs> it's, instead of making a fire in their fireplace. Um, but this idea that uh, light can, can kind of take us places, it can actually engender a theta state which is not quite the alpha state, which is a meditative state, state, but it is a state where we're thinking, but thinking without words. And so they're sort of drifting off, and you, you probably have done this, you just start, stared at something, you drift off. This is where light can connect you to these other realms, to this other part of your own consciousness. So light has this great, great power, and one of the things is if you put image into it, like in a movie. A movie is light, and I have to say I was really excited when I was young by Fantasia. I thought this was really going to be something, we're really headed somewhere. But the fact is, is that we just get involved in the story. The movie contains the story, so we get involved in the literature. But if you remove the image, you can actually feel the effect of light and what light can do. And the thing that's very interesting is there are now new experiments, and, and Arthur Zayance is one of those that was part of this, mm -hmm. where light knows when we're looking at it. That is, light has the behavior through a diffraction pattern when we're looking at it that's different than when we're not looking at it. This almost, if you want to anthropomorphize, it almost imbues light with consciousness. So that, that's a very powerful elixir and substance that we're talking about. And, and treating it that way, I think, is um, interesting yeah. and, and something that I, I have enjoyed doing. But um, it, do, it does blur. The, so, so this idea of, the, of, of nature, artificial, and, and us, one of our greatest conceits is to ever feel that we're apart from nature, that we're not nature itself, that what we do, I mean, uh, the first constructions ever seen on this planet were made by a being. It's not the Great Wall of China, it's the Great Barrier Reef. Those were the first things made by an organism that could be seen from outer space. And uh, we go about making our cities with about the same logic and uh, planning as the uh, the coral that makes the Barrier Reef. I mean, we change laws and we you know, pay off this and that, and we can get variances, and we can, all this planning that we once had to make cities is completely changed. So we have about the same kind of quality as, and the same <laughs> level of intelligence as the coral that makes the barrier reef. <laughs> <laughs> so then to end, I want one, I want to ask you one last question. I, I think we don't, there's the great sky space of Roden Crater in the center. Um, the tunnel, the image stone, which is at the base, this image Down stone, the which tunnel. is at the base of this tunnel, which is the world's longest refractor telescope. And now this is walking up the tunnel of Roden Crater in time. You walk toward this shape, um, and as you walk toward that circle, it becomes an ellipse. You felt it as a circle, and now it's an ellipse. You can actually travel these stairs into the heavens, like break through the plane and into the heavens, or look back on Earth and see the sky and this stone. Um, I think just in the interest of... We'll show the... Uh, this is one of the... Roden Crater is still being made. It's taking longer than the botanical garden piece. <laughs> So this is the next space, well, one of the spaces that you're working on right now, the south space, which again relates to something ancient or older. And the, the great, great reference here to the astronomer Prince uh, Jai Singh, who corresponded with Tycho Brahe. 
Um, and so this space is a, also a spherical space. An instrument. And it will, it will. That's the analemma. Analemma is the equation of time. You can't see it all here, but there's a shape that will be traced by the sun over the course at noon yeah. of the year at noon, and will follow this. So the shape of time will be physical inside Roden Crater. Uh, and here you will sit and look through this pointing device. And there's a little w washer in the center, yes. Yeah, there's a little pointing device here. And you lean back and you will look at the stars at night. And theoretically, you're you centered, want to describe it? You're centered right around the... Uh, Polaris. Around Polaris. And Polaris is the star right now that's nearest to our axis of rotation. We're moving from Polaris through precession to toward Vega. But right now, we're pretty close to Polaris. And, and then there's a space like this, and so that you can actually see. And uh, the outer, that's Ursula Minor, or the... Uh, Little Dipper. Yeah, Little Dipper. And uh, the, there's another space that's made so that uh, you can feel the rotation of the Earth. One of the things that we always feel is we feel that the sun comes up and then goes down. When in fact the sun is more the stable body and that the Earth is turning. And so that our turning towards it has the sun rise in the east and set in the west. But we don't feel that. But sometimes you may have been in a train or in a plane and the plane next to you uh, or even the gantry, the, the uh, jetway, or the train next to you moves, and you feel that you're moving, even though you're seeing it. Uh, so it's an illusion that you're moving when you're in fact you're not. Well, here I have this, I've taken away reference. This is again talking about the, the horizonless space. I take away reference to horizon all, put you in this space, and when you stare at it, you see the stars, and so the stars become your reference point, but then they are m moving, but that becomes your reference, so that you then feel that you are tipping, just like when you are in a train and the train next to you moves, and you feel that you're moving. So by this illusion <laughs> that's created, you feel what is actually happening, and that is that the Earth is turning. So um, sometimes it's interesting to, to feel that. Because you, you feel like you're tipping all the time as you're watching this thing. And you do tend to just slide off the side. I love that. The theater, which we started with, which delivers the truth. Yes. And ending, I just want to see, this is not your only project in Mexico. Uh, well, actually, I'm just going to, in this oh, interest yeah. of time, this is Houston's sky space. I, in the Quaker Meeting House. Quaker Meeting House, just to see other sky spaces. I don't know why this is not working. Uh, that's the interior. interior of the meeting house. Uh, this is in Japan, just to give you a sense. There's a house of light. Uh, oops, this is uh, Hollywood, which is, of course, a movie theater of light, sky space in a theater. And uh, finally, um, you have built a pyramid in the Yucatan. Uh, and I just want to end with one question, which is, how has your time in Mexico, which I know you were in Mexico long ago. Has it had an effect on your work? Can you describe in some way working in this amazing place, Mexico and the Yucatan here in Culiacan, and has it influenced you? Do you feel something about this place that has gone into the work? Well, I can tell you how it, it changed my life very early on. I was at Pomona College in Claremont, and I had a wonderful BSA 500 motorcycle and I went down with two friends and we traveled down to Mulehe down in Baja. This is 1961. The road was not paved and we had to fix flats a number of times. I came all the way down to La Paz and uh, because it took a little bit longer than I had expected, I would mail my homework into to the uh, <laughs> my mathematics professor and uh, I didn't know what math he was assigning in the class, so I just did all the problems in the book. 
And then I came back and, and took the test. I did very well on the test, and I, of course, had done all the problems in the book for homework. But he then recommended that maybe I not be a mathematics major, <laughs> that I might have interests somewhere else that were stronger. So it was because of my time uh, in Mexico. In Mexico <laughs> that you are I an changed, artist. I, That's I, what I, I was looking for, that answer. Because of Mexico. <laughs> You are an artist. So we've resolved that finally, once and for all. Thank you very much. <laughs> so thank you, James. Thank all of you. And I, I really, this is such a beautiful work you made here in the garden in Culiacan. Thank you so thank much. You.